Hello, I'd like to talk about the use of zelenogenate uh, for the second prevention of hip fracture, treating osteoporosis. Uh, this is work that's collaboration between the leads of the relevant national clinical audits for England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and, and Ireland, uh, along with other experts. And it grows out of observations from the National Hip Fracture Database, uh, which have uh, in this uh, in this last year made five recommendations about hip fracture care, one of which focuses on secondary prevention of hip fracture. Uh, and in its key performance indicator seven, what's asked for is that patients should be followed up um, so that hospitals can be conv can be sure that their patients are on some form of bone protection f at four month follow up after a hip fracture. What you can see is that between the 170 hospitals across the country, there's enormous variation from naught to more than 80% of patients being on uh, bone strengthening medication 120 days after their hip fracture. And some of the hospitals uh, and the authors of this uh, collaborative paper are running services in those hospitals. Um, some of those hospitals are managing extremely high rates of treatment. The National Hip Fracture Database can characterise exactly what goes on in terms of the drugs that people are taking before their fracture and discharged taking after fracture. And that allows us to construct a really detailed picture of what's going on in individual hospitals. And what you can see from, from this graph is that there's huge variation in the use of injectable therapies. The commonest treatment option, or the commonest approach to secondary prevention across the country is the white area. Uh, the majority of patients get nothing. The grey area is oral bisphosphonates. Despite the fact that we know that the majority of people who are who started on lendronate and discharged from hospital fail to continue taking it. So the whole of the white and grey area at the top of this page is essentially people getting little or no treatment to try and prevent the next fracture that's coming. Injectable therapies, on the other hand, you, you, you know that the patient is on treatment uh, and these are, are some of the most effective of the therapies available. Uh, and we know they're effective because there's a randomised control trial giving zeledronate to, to just this group of patients. Uh, patients were loaded with vitamin D, given, given intravenous zeledronate, it was followed uh, on an annual basis and what it showed is that the uh, reduction of risk of, of further fractures uh, was about one third in this group of patients. So why aren't we doing that? Well, the reasons why people aren't doing that are, are fears over uh, concerns raised over the, uh, the management of vitamin D deficiency, concerns over renal impairment, worries about osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, and concerns about the dosage and, and follow-up regimes. And we, uh, we need to address each of those in turn. And the handout for, for this talk is this paper that we published in Age and Aging earlier in the autumn, which goes through each of those points in turn. And we constructed an algorithm taking you through a pragmatic, sensible, safe approach yeah, to the use of zeledronate in this patient group. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through how that worked. So the first concern that patients um, that doctors uh, and teams raise when talking to me about why they're not using zeledronate is that they're, they're uncertain as to how they should deal with vitamin D deficiency. They have difficulty in getting blood tests and that sort of question. But we know vitamin D is, uh, deficiency is very common. The, the, the main reason for, for correcting it is to avoid patients becoming hypocalcemic after their zeledronate infusion. Uh, NICE recommends giving vitamin D uh, in divided doses over six to eight weeks, but, but they're talking about people in outpatients. In the acute setting, you need to do things far more quickly than that. Uh, but hospital pharmacists may be very concerned about letting you uh, get on a load of vitamin D in a way that's not uh, NICE approved. And part of the purpose of this guideline is to try and circumvent that and provide reassurance. Checking vitamin D levels uh, can cause enormous delays. You've got, to, you've got uh, uncertainty as to whether the results of vitamin D assays around the time of surgery are necessarily very reliable. But you're also sticking needles into patients who don't want that. There's the cost and the hassle of chasing up results. Uh, and you're doing all of that um, in, in, to, to check whether uh, somebody's vitamin D deficient, despite the fact that you know that the majority of them are, and that you could actually give them vitamin D without any real risk of, of toxicity. 
So what we're recommending is, is a loading regime of perhaps a couple of hundred thousand units of vitamin D. Um, if you give somebody, if you write up somebody for 200,000 units vitamin D as a single dose, um, there's a risk that they're nil by mouth on the day it was meant to be given, or they are given it and then lose it, um, or they don't take it. So our recommendation is that it should be split up over a number of days so that you can be confident that people get uh, at least 100,000 uh, units of that dose, even if one or two doses are missed. Um, toxicity is conceivable if somebody has unrecognized primary hyperparathyroidism and severe vitamin D deficiency. Uh, this is really unusual um, uh, as an as a actual problem. Um, but it is probably prudent that patients who come in and who are hypercalcemic still receive their vitamin D loading, still receive their intravenous selitronate, but have their calcium checked a few weeks later to make sure that um, this hasn't unmasked hyperparathyroidism and driven uh, hypercalcemia. But otherwise, our recommendation is that patients should get on, be loaded with split doses of vitamin D um, without uh, waiting for or checking vitamin D status. And I've not checked vitamin D status on any out of thousands of patients I've treated over the last decade. Second concern that's raised is about the management of patients with renal impairment. And that's really challenging in this uh, population the BNF, the Medicine and Health Regulating Authority, um, and the Summary of the Medical Product Characteristics for Sulfonylate all talk about uh, creatinine clearance of greater than 35 mils a minute. And you, you need to use creatinine clearance because these are these ladies, these are commonly small, um, older women, uh, and EGFR results are not reliable in that setting. So these are data from patients in my unit. What you can see is the EGFR result for, for the, these patients is substantially higher than the blue figure, which is for in each individual the calculated creatinine clearance. What you can what you can see is that on average the creatinine clearance is is, is 19 points worse than the EGFR estimate. Uh, and for a substantial proportion of patients, um, a reliance on EGFR will leave you missing. Uh, significant renal impairment. So you need to be using a creatinine clearance. But actually people aren't. Um, in a, uh, this is a survey we did um, in the same way uh, as the survey we're doing today. Uh, this is a survey we did in the Oslo Fra Fragility Fracture Network Congress earlier uh, this autumn uh, where we asked people how they uh, set their threshold for, for safe use of selenogenate. Um, and though 11% were using a creatinine clearance of greater than 30, um, as, in the, as in the trial paper, um, there was another 70% of patients, 70% of hospitals, who were using EGFR cr criteria. And those EGFR criteria are, are equivalent to creatinine clearance of, of 30 or, or, or even lower. Uh, so, so actually, hospitals around the world are already using much lower creatinine clearances than the BNF uh, and the other recommendations. So, so we know this is already happening. Um, and that's not unreasonable because that's exactly what happened in the randomized controlled trial. They, they limited this to people with a creatinine clearance of 30 or more. Uh, and when they did so, uh, they didn't see uh, significant differences in renal adverse events. Uh, and Apinda Sahota uh, in a uh, project has done exactly the same. It's given um, 5 milligrams of intravenous selegenate uh, to people who wouldn't have been eligible if he'd been cut off at a 35 mil per minute creatinine clearance. These are people with a lower creatinine clearance and following it up, their creatinine clearance was not worsened by the receipt of selegenate. So we know this is safe, though uh, Apinda as you can see, was more cautious in the speed at which the zolotronate was given. Uh, it's not so much the dose, but perhaps the peak dose in the, in the blood that might have the potential to cause renal impairment. So if you're concerned about people's renal function, then perhaps give the infusion more slowly. And that's the recommendation that we make in the, in the paper. Uh, use a creatinine clearance, set a threshold of, of at least 30, um, and be cautious of the speed at which things are given to patients in the in the lower ranges of creatinine clearance. What about osteonecrosis of the jaw? 
Well, we know it exists and, and dentists are happy to show us um, ghastly pictures of, of people's mouths. But this is really a condition that's uh, associated with the high dose and repeated use of bisphosphonates for cancer. It's much less common in osteoporosis and one study showed a single case in 6,000 patients. So this is rare and you have to set that against the fact that further fractures are very common. 25% uh, is quite different from 1, 000, 1 in 6,000. Um, so so the, the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm are dramatically different. If you're faced with concerns over the use of, of, um, of selegronate, recommend looking at the Scottish guideline uh, on um, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, but really, th this is a rare condition. Patients should be informed don't want to give this to people who look as though they are already developing ONJ before you go in. Uh, but this shouldn't be stopping us treating people to prevent the very common and catastrophic complication of further fractures. How soon is it safe to give this? Um, and it's important to, to get on and start this. People are fracturing, uh, many people are refracturing, many of them are refracturing quite soon, and we know that you can have an impact within months. Um, after after a zelegenate infusion. Um, unfortunately, the SNPC for, for a cluster, um, for the for zelegenate 5 milligrams, um, recommends that it should be given at least two weeks after hip fracture repair. So again, there's a, there's a potential barrier there to, to, to the use of this in an earlier period. Why, why does it say that? Well, the reason for that is that this post hoc analysis of the Horizon study um, identified that giving the bisphosphonate uh, within one to two weeks didn't have a significant effect on bone density. Um, that's what this graph shows. Well, actually, it isn't what this graph shows. What this graph shows is that the effect on bone density wasn't significant. This is an, uh, an absence of evidence, not an evidence of absence. Um, this, the, the proportion of patients who received it with one or two weeks was very small. In a small group, you get long error bars, and as a result, they didn't achieve significance in that subgroup. Um, but I bet they would have done, and I'll bet quite large amounts of money that they would have done if they'd gotten more patients, because if you follow the same group of patients up to two years, you can see that the error bars are significant, and indeed that the, the benefits in terms of bone mineral density are as high in that group as in any other timing uh, of the zelegronate infusion after fracture. So this is something we could get on and do early. Uh, we know it's safe, it's well tolerated, it's not more likely to give you an acute phase reaction if you give it early. It doesn't seem to be associated with non-union or delayed fracture healing. How much we should we give? Well, the, the, the recommended dose is five milligrams. Um, dose ranging studies comparing five milligrams and more frequently um, 10 milligrams um, and smaller doses um, have shown that five milligrams is more, more effective than very much smaller doses. But frankly, any dose of, of this drug would keep nice happy in terms of cost effectiveness because this is such a, ch a cheap and cost effective medication. No trial has compared five milligrams and four milligrams. Um, though a small study uh, suggested negligible differences in bone turnover between five and four milligrams. Um, and that matters because the cost of a cluster um, at 300 pounds uh, is very dramatically different from the cost of the generic formulations. And the generic form of um, four milligram is extremely cheap. Uh, and if you're working in a, a country with a health economy that's uh, financially challenged, uh, and perhaps we all are, um, the less, less expensive formulation uh, may, be, uh, may be more easily justified or more easily funded. Um, and in, in our experience, it, we had considerable difficulty getting hold of the 5 milligram, uh, so we've used 4 milligram for a number of years. How long should patients be on this? Well, we know that biochemically, um, the benefits of biochemically and in terms of BMD, a single dose of, of zelegronate has effects that will last for several years. Um, and in this frail population, 
um, life expectancy doesn't run to several years for many people. Uh, so the first dose is potentially going to give people bone protection for what will be the whole of the rest of their life. We, we know that uh, two-thirds of patients with hip fracture will not last for, for five years. They're not, they're not surviving five years. So uh, for, for the frailer patients, uh, a single dose may be appropriate, and it would avoid them having to come back uh, to, uh, to attend outpatients um, for, for further doses. So that might be appropriate. Um, the Horizon study struggled to find real differences uh, between patients who received a single dose and, and three doses in terms of uh, fracture protection. Um, but in an extension, uh, there was demonstrable benefit in people who received it uh, for, for longer in terms of vert uh, vertebral fracture risk reduction. Uh, so our recommendations are that we should be thinking about giving people doses at 12 to 18 months. Uh, but it's the first dose that really matters. And the question really isn't, you know, what, how, how am I going to treat this person over the next few years? Is The question we should be asking us is, if I'm going to give this person to Nedronate, and what, what shall I do beyond that? What, what do I do next? Um, I'm going to get everybody onto Zaledronate. Uh, my question is, which of them should we be following up and thinking about um, for further doses of Zaledronate or, or a switch to an alternative form of therapy in people who might be capable or appropriate for that? So we have a guideline that tries to reflect the approach taken in the randomised control trial that affected fracture risk and mortality in exactly this patient group. And I think it's important that we recognise that that was a randomised control trial. It did work, it was powerful and effective. And actually what's going on in the UK at the moment is a continuing randomised trial. And we're not individually randomising, this is currently, we're just continuing to run a cluster randomised trial. And many hospitals are essentially condemning their patients to receive the placebo arm of the Horizon study. That isn't acceptable and what we hope we've provided in this uh, paper is clear guidance to help you reassure your local teams, particularly the local pharmacists, who are often the most uncertain and uncomfortable about the approaches uh, that we've recommended, to provide a guideline that allows them to, to develop this in a way that's been done in many hospitals. In my own hospital we have a clerking document uh, and that now includes the recommendation that the house officer, when they first see somebody, loads them with vitamin D and, if, if uh, permissible in terms of creatinine clearance, gets on and writes up IV zoledronate uh, for, for those patients. That means that as an orthogeriatrician, I'm not going around writing zoledronate up on everybody, as I've done for thousands of occasions in the past. My job now is to be looking at what, what therapy would be appropriate uh, either instead of zoledronate in, in some individuals or as follow-on therapy. Uh, is it, it, should they be having further doses of zoledronate or other bone uh, treatments, other injectable therapies um, further down the line? Uh, and if you need to reassure people or educate people further, uh, if you look up my Cardiff University website, there's a talk there on osteoporosis, and this talk will also be there uh, for you to share with them.